May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I was blind, but now I see. I could hardly believe my own eyes when I finally, finally had a moment to look at the gospel lesson for this morning. Yet you know what? I'm not even sure why I was surprised. All week long in our morning and evening prayer liturgies, it seems that the text, every time, could not be more relevant to our current situation. There are so many verses that we have prayed together this week that spoke right to the core of my heart. And now this morning, I was blind, but now I see. I'm pretty sure I'm not alone. I have to admit, it has been an incredibly overwhelming week and frightening in so very many ways. There have been moments when it's been hard, really hard, not to fall into despair, not to be overcome with anxiety and worry about so many things and so many people, and not to just simply collapse into a total state of denial and anger. I'm really not alone, right? You guys are with me? And, and we know, and we believe, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Despite the uncertainty that is happening all around us, we are the church. We continue to be the church, even though that we are separated from all of the places and the people and the routines and the jobs that we have all come to know as all of the things that make up our lives. All of that has changed in the span of just a few days. Yet we are people of faith. We continue on through it all, hoping and loving in the name of the Lord. That is who we are and what we are about. That is why every one of us can sing Amazing Grace with emotion and intensity and integrity and passion. Those lyrics are etched into the walls of our hearts like beautiful, artful calligraphy. We are God's people. We are the church. Blind from birth, but now we see. Guess what I have for all of you this morning? A story! <laughs> Surprised you with that one, didn't I? I get asked all the time, okay, maybe that's an exaggeration. I get asked a lot, why in my not so younger years did I change careers and end up becoming a priest? It's a complicated answer. I know that I had wrestled with the inkling of some idea that God wanted me to do something for years. It started somewhere during my teenage years. But time after time, I said no. I went the other direction. I made lots of mistakes. I went to church occasionally. I went to work. I'm still pretty sure that I might have done a few things that God would not have approved of. But my life wasn't terrible. It was good. But at that point in my life, it was, I don't know, maybe like I was a little bit on autopilot. Was, something seemed flat. There was something missing. Something that I could not see. And in 2009, for reasons that I cannot explain at all, something started to change. Now you have to understand that 2009 was a bad year. It was bad. Started in January, my mother died suddenly at the age of 60. I myself had two surgeries. One was probably what they would have considered urgent. The other was an emergency surgery. Before the year was over, I was diagnosed with moderate to severe ulcerative colitis. It was a tough year. There was a lot of uncertainty. There were plenty of things to be fearful of. And even still, in the midst of the grief and the worry and fear, there was something new that was happening in my heart. 
I can't really explain it actually. And I think that's supposed to be the way that conversions work. I think that's how Christ works in our lives. Maybe we aren't supposed to be able to explain it and to figure it out. Maybe it's just something that we are supposed to rest into the process. I guess. I'm not really sure. I don't I can't put to words how conversions work. But I do know that that year there was a lot of mud to wade through. And yet, somehow, not of anything of my own accord, but somehow, things, something started to change. I started to see things in a new way, in a different way, like I never had seen things before. I became aware of new and different things, and I have no explanation. I have no words to explain how that happened. But though I can't explain it, I still know it to be true. And I also knew that my life would never be the same. And somewhere in that year, maybe a little bit after that, I made up my mind that no matter what happened, I was going to follow the path wherever and however far it led. And here I am. I was blind, and now I see. The epistle reading this morning opens with, once you, are dark, once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Even in the midst of all of the darkness that surrounds us today, the darkness of fear, anxiety, uncertainty, we are still children of the light. We are the church. And we will get through this together. Even though we aren't physically near one another, we are together. And we mustn't forget that. And there's something else that we must remember. Spiritually, we need to be prepared to hold each other up. There is going to come a time somewhere along the way when the social distancing and the shelter in place, when all of that is going to wear us down. Those are the moments when we need to be able to pick up the phone, to drop in, in a prayer ser- on a prayer service, to laugh at a bad joke, or sit with a family member or a pet, or look at the flowers, or listen to the birds sing, or call somebody up and just plain vent about all of the things, all of the darkness that has built up inside of us. These are the times when we must be gentle and kind and patient with ourselves and with other people. We must be quick to forgive and slow to anger if we can help it. Why? Because we are all children of the light. We were all born blind to the darkness, but now we see. And this unchartered territory that we've been thrust into, it is going to be hard. But we can do it. I know that we can do it. I may not be sure how we're going to do it. I'm not quite sure what it looks like. But I do know this. God is with us. God is still with us. Now, if you don't believe any of this for yourself, it's okay. Believe it because I believe it. They told me nine years ago, for a year and a half, when one by one I became allergic to each medication that they tried, every time I went to the doctor for a year and a half, they would say to me, Lisa, you need to let us remove your colon. And I kept saying, hmm, I think I might still need it. And once I let you take it, I can't get it back. <laughs> so I pleaded with the doctor, just give me three more months. Let's, let's, let's have this conversation again in three more months. Try this medication. How about we try this? What about this? And somehow, though none of us really know why, for seven years, I've been in remission. And I still have my colon. Now, just so you know, that also means that I'm immunocompromised. 
I'm one of those faceless people who on the outside looks pretty healthy. You probably wouldn't know it, but I'm one of those vulnerable people. And there's a lot of us around. We just don't know each other's names. So please, stay home. Wash your hands. Sing. Pray. Laugh. Call someone on, on the phone. Love. Love God. Love your neighbor. Love yourself. That's the way God wants it to be. And we'll figure out all the rest later. In Jonas's words, love big and be well. I love you all.